Good afternoon, Fabian, and thank you very much for joining me to talk to the Mint uh, uh, from Russia. Good evening, because it's evening here. All right, Good evening, evening, Mr. Hoover. I'm really glad to have this interview with you from Russia to Great Britain. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, what I'd like to start uh, talking about is if you could give a brief overview of what your situation in Afghanistan was uh, before the Taliban um, took over. Well, in Afghanistan, I used to work as a translator to the United Nations in agreements. Besides that, I was an activist and a debater. So I was in university and uh, I was a somehow activist student. <laughs> And where, where did you live? I lived in capital city, Kabul. Okay. And were you at all aware of the dangers that the Taliban might take back control? Of course. Before Taliban took over the governments, there were a lot about Taliban's empowerment. Taliban is getting more powerful, especially after after the agreement between United States and Taliban in Doha, Qatar, everyone in Afghanistan were predicting about the empowerment of Taliban and taking over the government once again. And how did that, I mean, did you start planning for that? Were you worried about that? Well, of course, everybody was worried. We were really worried because the uh, suicide bombs were increasing. The attacks on every side of Afghanistan were increasing, and even some of the provinces were given to Taliban, even uh, without any uh, further war between them. Just there was no fight. They just gave the whole province to Taliban. And you said you were an activist. I mean, what sort of activist were you, and how did that affect your vulnerability? In Afghanistan, the kind of activist is like, uh, we were working on women rights. We were working on making uh, a modern Afghanistan for youngsters. And uh, we were a group in university, which we were participating in most of international events, such as Holt Prize, international debate competitions. And beside that, there was a group called Afghanistan Progressive Thinking which they were supporting all youngsters, the students of universities, to go farther with uh, improvement, with having their own minds and expressing it. And so did you, was it clear therefore to you that if the Taliban took back control, you would be, you know, someone that they would have as a target? Of course, we knew that because uh, before, even in university, there were agents of Taliban. Like after Taliban took over the government, I get to know a lot of my own classmates. They were agents, and before they were just spreading information to them. So the extremism and the mindset that they had, it was really clear if they take the government, like people the same as them, we are going to be in danger. Money. And... <clears throat> When it actually happened, when the Taliban uh, took over, how did what were the immediate effects? How did tell me about the day that that happened and 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 how it felt? Well, the day was really traumatizing for me and for people the same as me because I was on exact same day. I was inside the classroom studying when one of the security guards of the university came and said that. Taliban came to the capital city. Just go to your houses, leave university. We left university, there was a really huge traffic jam. Everybody left their cars, people left their properties. They just went to the airport. They were just seeking refuge from Americans who had their own bases inside the airports. And had you made any preparations, given you were worried about this happening and the news suggested it might? Have you made any preparations for this eventuality? We were not expecting at all that it's going to happen very fast because 
A week ago, a Western city in Afghanistan, my native city, Herat, Taliban took over Herat, and after that, we were thinking that at least it's going to take, take three months or four months for them to reach the capital city, to Kabul. But in just a week, they took over. Even when they were inside the capital city, our president, he came to, uh, he broadcasted a video of himself saying that, I am in Afghanistan, don't worry, everything is in order. But just an hour later, he left Afghanistan. So you were trying to head home for safety, uh, and did you make it home? Of course, I I made it home because like uh, I could see armies of Afghanistan, the military of Afghanistan. They were on the road, they were standing, they were supporting people. I saw them with my own eyes. They were crying and saying that we are supposed to fight for now. But there were others as commanders and generals. They were saying, no, we lost it. We could hear that. And that was it. We went to our houses. We reached. And when you were at home, what, what were your immediate thoughts? What were you going to do next? The first thing was that I'm going to hide anything I have related to foreign companies, related to foreigners, especially about languages. Even we were not believing in Taliban that they are going to, not going to arrest us for knowing a foreign language because they are really strict minded. So me with my father, as my, my father was a previous um, a worker at government. He was working at public sector. So uh, he was a target for them. I was a target for them because I was working with the United Nations. And the same, my brother, my sisters, and everybody. So we just stayed home and stayed quiet, destroying anything we had related to experiences that we have. I mean, and so what happened? How long did that sort of period of you just being at home and, and lying low go on for? And, and when did that, when did you feel that you had to get out? Well, as uh, one of my relatives, uh, he was working at uh, United States Embassy inside Afghanistan. He went to the airport. He went to the airport and he saw that everybody is getting a lot and a lot of relatives with themselves. So he called us and said that as I am working at the embassy, I have uh, the capability to take more than 20 of you. So come to the airport. We went to the airport so that we could reach inside and we seek refuge from for Americans, which were inside the airport. But unfortunately, only my sister, she could make it. And she went inside, for now she's living in America. So how was it that she got in and no one else did in your family? Well, she went with her husband and we were separated. So... I don't know how, but there was a really huge crowd, but she made it inside. And after that, the door closed. We could not make it. Blimey, how did you feel when you saw the door closing? <laughs> well, on one side, there were Taliban. On the other side, there were Americans. Americans were throwing uh, uh, not bombs, but uh, it was like uh, only for a mass amount of sound. So the waves of sound, they were throwing from one side, Taliban were having shotguns from other side. We were traumatized at what we were going to do. But at least I, as a former translator for the United Nations, I had this thought that Taliban, is, they are not going to recognize me in these days because they are really busy with the crowd. So you felt you could escape and keep a low profile. So did you all head home again then? And, and yes, after we could not make it inside, all of us, like the rest of the family, we went back home. And what, what did you think of doing then next? Well, we were just thinking about how to get out of Afghanistan, how we can make it. And outside there were shotguns. Outside people were using the opportunity they were stealing. And it was a revolution in Afghanistan. Like everybody, there was no 
uh, right. There was no uh, law in Afghanistan at that time. Everybody were doing what they wanted to. And I suppose people would know, neighbors would know where that you were on the side, you know, you were vulnerable. Did anyone try and steal from you? Well, on that time, to be honest, our neighbors, they were more vulnerable than us because they were like uh, one of our neighbors. He was a uh, senator in the parliament. Another one, he was um, having a huge business and uh, uh, like the contract of emerald mine in the northern city of Panjshir. So they were more vulnerable than us. So I suppose were crowds going around looting? Well, yes, on that time. The places which were closed, they were closed, but other places which was open, the, like uh, I can say that about the cars which were outside, they were left behind. People were looting. Right. So we're now in the following few days from the takeover. <clears throat> mm -hmm. How long did, when, when did you decide to actually leave? Because you're now, obviously, you're now in Russia. Where, how did that play out? Well, one day after everything got normal, like uh, they were somehow controlling the society, I got out. I thought that everything is normal. Then I saw one of my previous classmates. So, of course, as I told you, they were former agents for Taliban. He saw me and he asked me about some, my thoughts about Taliban, which I told you before, they were really extremists. Their minds, they, it was really strict. They asked me that. Do you remember the time that you were saying bad about Taliban? And I was like, on that time, I had different mindset. For now, I respect them. So I was arrested once. The second time, I was tortured. So I left the capital city at all. I went to my native city because on on uh, inside my native city, I was not known for the Taliban there. But inside capital city, most of my friends, my classmates, the university students, people who knew me, people I worked for, they were agents of Taliban. I'm just going back. You said you were tortured. What did yes. that? What did that involve? Well, uh, before Taliban they took over governments, I had a friend. His name was Rahid Amin. So he was killed in the terrorist attack of, well, basically ISIS, but I believe that it was Taliban in Kabul University. So he was a really good student. He was active the same as me, and he was killed. So all the time inside the university that was talking about him, that Taliban are so relentless that they're killing students. Look at the cities in northern parts. Look at the cities in western parts which for now, like I'm talking about before, which Taliban, they have control over. How they're torturing people, how they are just killing people, they're relentless. So after they took over, they saw me, they tortured me. They beat really hard. Like still some nights I'm thinking about that and I cannot sleep. I'm traumatized by that. I would imagine. So that, yes. <clears throat> so you were beaten up you were, uh, why did they let you go? Well, as an opposite of the first time Taliban take over, took over Afghanistan, in this time, Taliban are divided into groups. Not all of them are the same. Some of them, they have really good mindsets, but some of them are really strict. So people who tortured me, they were strict. But another one, when he came, he also knew me inside university. He just let me go. Blimey, so you were very lucky that <clears throat> someone turned up that yes. was more a sort of more liberal Taliban. <clears throat> yes, yes. So after that experience, you then headed back to your hometown, Herat, on the basis that people wouldn't, you wouldn't be picked out. How long did that last? How, how possible was it to keep a low profile in Herat? And how did you live? Well, I was for closely five months, I was in different cities. I was not only in Herat, I went to other cities also, just in order not to make myself as a sign and 
as a valuable loot for Taliban to take me. So it took about five months. And after that, I got in contact with one of the universities in Russia. And I chose the preparatory course of Russian language. It's a short term course, it's only one year. So I was like, whatever, I just want to get out of Afghanistan. So you got, you enrolled on this course in Russia? Yes. That, I mean, did you, was, was Russia just because that seemed the only opportunity? Well, of course, on that time, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, none of these countries, they had their embassies open except Russia. Only Russia was open. So you managed to apply for this course and then you needed to get a flight. Yes, I managed to take the course. After that, I came back to the capital city. I went to the embassy of Russia. So it took me about less than 12 hours to have my visa. And then I left. And so how come they let you in? I mean, did you have to meet some criteria? Uh, why were they willing to take you? Well, first of all, I have TOEFL IBT, the level of English which is it's their standards in Russia. The second, my father, he is a former translator for the Soviet Union. So of course, when I told about the history, they instantly accepted me. So when the Soviet Union had been uh, uh, occupied uh, uh, Afghanistan, your father had worked for them? Yes, my father worked as a translator for them. So, so he must have spoken Russian, obviously fluently. But you were, of you were just, you were just learning Russian. Of course, my father is fluent with Russian language because he studied during Soviet Union here. So he was really good with it, and he was the one that called to the embassy of Russia and said that, "How do you accept applicants?" So they told about the eligibilities that you have to first apply to the university a short-term or long-term course. After that, they are going to send you an invitation. After that, you are going for the medical examinations and you will have the visa. So that's how, how I came. And you managed still to, your family still had the money to be able to afford the, the flight and um, well, and on. Of course, like on that time, my father, the only thing he wanted was for me to be alive. So he managed to pay the tuition for this university and he managed to pay for the flight and I instantly left Afghanistan. And what about the rest of your family? Are they still there or uh, have all your family now escaped? Well, about the rest of my family, my one of my sisters, she is living in America. Another sister of mine, she is living in India. Two of my sisters and one my my brother, my only brother. With my parents, they are living in Afghanistan, but it is not as free as it looks. They are going to my native city and it's bordering with Iran. So they're going to Iran, coming back, going to Iran, coming back. And what, what are they going to Iran for? Well, they're just escaping the situation, of course. So they're going to Iran, but they're coming back. So then they've not actually left Iran permanently? Well, yes, they are not leaving uh, Afghanistan permanently or they are living in Iran for like a long term. They are just going and coming back as their visa acquires for them <laughs> because it's three months. And, and going to Iran helps how? It means they can earn money or, or what, what are the benefits of being in Iran? For uh, well, the first benefit is like my uncle, he's having a business in Iran, so they're going there. The second one is that whenever they see the situation really tight in Afghanistan, they're leaving for some time to Iran, and when they see that it's getting normal, they're back. And so you, you managed to get to Russia. <clears throat> what did it feel like arriving in Russia? You've never been to Russia before, I guess. So. Well, yes. What was the experience before like have, arriving in Russia? Well, before I have been to many other countries, I have been to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, people say it's the same as Russia, but it's not. Well, of course, what I heard about Russia was different from what I experienced. Like, <laughs> as I heard, 
It was like Russian people, they are having a gun everywhere. Russian people, they are living with a bear. Russian people, they are always with vodka, with alcohol. Well, it was not like that. When I reached here, I was welcomed really warm by Russians. Well, at first, I, as I enrolled to the short-term course of Russian language, I was um, attracted by the university staffs themselves because they were really uh, surprised how I chose Russia, not going to European countries because of the level of English I have. And besides that, um, I get to know some groups, the same as touristy club. I went to the gym with Russians. I managed to have friends. And uh, it was not as I expected. It was better than that, better than uh, drunk people with bears. <laughs> <laughs> and what, bit, what part of Russia is it? It's the northern part of Russia. It's called Arkhangelsk. And uh, we are bordering, not bordering, the White Sea is located here. The, the sorry? Say that again. White Sea. The White Sea. Yes. So is this, is this, sorry, north, east, south, west, Russia? Where, it's uh, the northern part. It's northern part of Russia, Arkhangelsk, and bordering with the region of Murmansk. Right. So, <clears throat> So how far away is it from Moscow? It's about 1,150 kilometers from Moscow. Which I suppose, I mean, obviously Russia is an absolutely huge place. Um, and uh, does it make a difference, you think, being a long way from Moscow in terms of the nature of the place? Well, I, I don't see any difference between regions here because they are all the same but about the modernity of course moscow moscow st petersburg yekaterinburg sochi there are some special uh, specific uh, regions which are much more modern than others but about living as a student i don't see any difference because like uh, if i say about the food it's the same if i say about the nature here it's not about civilization it's about nature it's really beautiful so you're able to get into the uh, the countryside is it still quite it hasn't been sort of industrialized has it or uh, there's still original natural nature to go and visit well it's a small town to be honest but like uh, it's a small town and it's quite modern, but I cannot compare it to Moscow, of course. So you're a student now. Uh, how long are you going to be? A, what What do you study now? Well, I finished my preparatory course of Russian language, and I'm planning to enroll as a linguistic student. So. Once you finish that, are you going to be able to, are you planning to settle there as, and work as an interpreter? Well, about the future, I'm not really sure, but as long as they let me to live here, I think I'm going to live because I feel home here because <laughs> I'm now used to it. Even, but you have no family there or, or you're, do you have any? connections there back to Afghanistan? In Moscow, yes, but not here. So it must be quite lonely. Uh, to be honest, I don't feel really lonely here because, because of the different events, the excursions, and uh, like um, every time I get bored, I have a lot of friends who are helping me to solve the situation so i don't feel really lonely here and how do you think this dramatic change uh, the you know you being under threat for your life tortured and having to escape uh, um, has affected you do you think you see life differently now well of course for now everything i look for is improvement opportunities in Afghanistan, I really worked hard for what I wanted, for improvement for other youngsters, but unfortunately, it didn't work out. 
nobody took me seriously because Taliban took over. But here, even the smallest things I do, people take it serious and they are looking forward to um, expand it. As an example, I can tell you, like uh, some days ago, I was talking to a friend about me being an activist and working as a journalist for some time in Afghanistan. And they promised that uh, they're going to help me get my ID card as international journalist here in Russia. Wow, and I was just wondering, you know, you said you woke up sometimes at night uh, with what I think is often called post-traumatic stress uh, mm -hmm. uh, disorder, and, and you get uh, um, memories and images of uh, um, the, what's happened to you. Is that still happening? Uh, and does that, how does that affect you? Well, sometimes it happens, but not quite a lot for now. The first days, of course, it was really hard for me. The first days I left Afghanistan, I came here. Everyone I saw, I was thinking as agents because of the situation I faced. And when I came here, people were treating me good, but I was still not trusting them because trust was destroyed in my mind once for all. So suddenly, so many people you thought were friends and so forth betrayed you or you saw that they were on the other side. And in Russia, I mean, it's sort of interesting, um, I suppose, from a European or UK viewpoint. Um, many people might think that um, Russia is also a, a dangerous place if you say the wrong thing or, or you know, that uh, obviously it's a uh, dictatorship or, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the, the general line we're, we're told is, of course, the reason that uh, Putin won was because most of his potential opponents were either in jail or, or killed. Um, so you, if you want to be an activist, presumably that could be quite dangerous too. Well, I believe that what people are seeing is from outside Russia. And if people come to Russia, I believe that they're not going to think the same because there are quite a lot of journalists from foreign countries, such as America, United Kingdom, from Canada, and some other Euro European countries, they're living here and uh, they're having a life for themselves. So sometimes they're criticizing. Are, are these journalists working for external newspapers i mean effectively not russian newspapers but foreign newspapers or foreign media well i have i have no idea about that that's what kind of newspapers or media you're working for but as far as my personal experience i sometimes criticize i sometimes criticize university i criticize the government and i have seen no consequences for that people take it seriously and they are saying that, well, because of this reason, it might happen or because of that reason, it might change. So I don't see any threat to myself. So some, um, I suppose, some criticisms are allowed. Uh, I suppose it, it all depends on where the limits of, uh, are. Uh, sorry. I just wonder where the limits are. For, uh, um, <clears throat> as to how oh. long it would go. In well, about the, uh, about the limits, I'm not sure, but as long as a person, as a foreigner, I always believe this. If I'm living in a country, I should respect their regulations and their rules. So as far as I'm considering that, I believe that there is no threat for me. And the limits, I have no idea what are the limits here. So in terms of do you think you're, you, you said the effect of the Taliban taking over and how you were treated meant you lost a lot of, you became very untrustworthy and uh, worried that people would betray you and so on. And do you think now you've, you've got through that? 
or I mean, do you do you now, for instance, keep a a bag ready with stuff to escape? Uh, um, you know, do you feel yourself more, you know, an ongoing worry about your situation, or do you feel totally safe again? Well, in this closely two years that I'm living here, I didn't see any betrayal, especially by Russians. And maybe I faced some, but it was not by Russians, but by foreigners living in Russia. Of course, I faced that. How so, what, what foreigners in Russia have threatened you? No, not about threatening, but it's about like uh, some betrayal, deceiving. So, uh, well, there are a lot of foreigners here from Uzbekistan, from Tajikistan, from Afghanistan, from like uh, for now, even in this northern cities, we have from Japan and a lot from China, Colombia. So maybe if I face any betrayal or like I'm talking about the words, about the speech, I'm not talking about uh, physical threats or something really serious. It happens by foreigners living in Russia, not by Russians themselves. So you find the Russians more trustworthy, effectively? As my personal experience, I can see yes. So, I mean, having gone through all this um, with your family, I suppose, thrown in all directions, um, you seem, I have to say, the way you talk about it and smile, you 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 seem to have remained uh, throughout it incredibly positive. Do you think that's partly because you're a very positive person? I believe that it's both. First, I'm an optimistic person. I'm looking for future and for a positive future. The second is what I experienced here, like. Uh, if I was in Afghanistan and I was optimist the same way I'm here, I don't think that I would be the same. But I think it's about, like for now, I'm starting my own business, I'm teaching English for kids and for uh, adults. I have a blogging platform, I have a website which I created by myself for uh, Russians and foreigners who want to learn English. And I'm cheered by the society here. So that is what makes me happy here. Well, thank you very much, Farin, for um, talking to me. Uh, I'm incredibly uh, admiring of your ability to have come through this, what must have been a horrific experience, uh, um, and come out the other end uh, in, with such a, a positive outlook on the world. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm really, uh, first of all, I'm surprised because uh, it's my first time having an interview with a, uh, somehow I can say Western media <laughs> in <laughs> Russia, because yeah. most of the times, as I see through social media, uh, people are talking about Russia and about things inside Russia, but they are living outside. And I can see that surprising and I'm really happy that I could share the reality. And I hope that one day we're all going to live it in peace together, all nations with their own uh, rules and regulation, with their own values and tradition. I hope that it happens. But I suppose actually, well, one thing I'm having, you having said that, I mean, I suppose there is a question of reality and, you know, but, Clearly, there are different senses of reality externally, like the reality from Putin is that um, he is fighting a war of aggression uh, in Ukraine. And it's interesting, I don't know whether he, that he had uh, attacked it in order to save it in some sense. Uh, whereas, of course, here we see that the Russia is aggressive towards a set of people who are independent uh, uh, and so on. And I suppose that must be a topic that is quite tricky. Well, it's quite tricky, but I, I can have my own opinion on that. Well, that's good. Uh, and I suppose uh, um, uh, 
hopefully, I mean, um, this, that war too may not go on forever, but it's not looking very good at the moment, is it? Well, as it seems, <laughs> like as my per personal experience living in Afghanistan under the control of NATO and America, well, I, as long as there is intervention from Westerns, I don't think it's going to last for a short time. It's going to be really long. No, mm. I suppose on the other side, as long as the intervention from Russia, <laughs> that's the same, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> that was another topic which wasn't, uh, uh, um, uh, which obviously is a huge topic, it's only right, and we don't really have time to give it the, uh, uh, um, uh, but it's very interesting that you are there as, I suppose, uh, um, someone who's neither Russian nor Western, uh, uh, <laughs> a, a, a different particular view. But thank you very much, Fadin, and uh, um, I look forward to talking to you again. Um, thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for this interview. I really enjoyed. Thank you very much. Brilliant.